Hello, and welcome to the uh, third talk in PDF's fifth series of expert briefings uh, entitled Parkinson's Disease, Swallowing, and Dental Challenges. Um, as um, uh, all of you know who have been to these uh, talks in the past, our webinar series cover uh, some of the most important topics in Parkinson's as um, verified to us uh, by the people who participate in these talks because we take advantage of um, uh, quizzing uh, and surveying um, uh, our community uh, frequently to make sure that we get uh, topics that are particularly relevant to them. And it is significant today that we're taking up one that you don't see uh, on the average uh, roster of subjects for Parkinson's. And it's on the, the list today because it is considered very important by a very significant number of people who live with Parkinson's and their families who we're in touch with. So it demonstrates the power here of crowdsourcing, and certainly I want to say how grateful we are at the Parkinson's Disease Foundation to people who help us uh, plan this series. Um, I also want to express our gratitude at PDF for the two corporate sponsors of this series this year, uh, two corporate names well known to many of you with their involvement in Parkinson's treatments. One is AbbVie Incorporated, and the other is Teva Neuroscience. We thank these two companies very much for their support. As always, they know and you know uh, that the uh, editorial decisions on our educational materials, including these webinars, of course, are ours, uh, uh, but they help us uh, enormously uh, to put this on, and we're very grateful to them. Uh, please note, all of you who are on this webinar, that the PowerPoint slide deck that we'll be using today can be downloaded from the reminder email that you should have received this morning, or if you prefer, from the PDF website, uh, sorry, web page that highlights this talk. Um, I should note that for this session, we always do a count in advance, and we find that uh, we have people on this call from every one of the 50 states of the United States, uh, 18 foreign countries, non-American countries, and a total of more than 1,000 people who signed up. So we're thrilled to have them all today, and thank you all for being here. I hope you find it as useful as I will. I plan to learn a lot today, an area I don't know very much about. So we're just thrilled we're doing this. Um, if there are people, I know there are among you, some health professionals, uh, be aware that there is one continuing education unit for health professionals uh, representing the hour that you're on the phone, um, and we're offering us free of charge uh, through the courtesy of the American Society on Aging. We're very grateful for that relationship. So if you haven't already registered for your CEU, please know that you are entitled to do this. And you, can, you will receive an email afterwards because we know who you are with steps as to how you can connect, uh, collect it. So I hope you'll take advantage of that and add to your resume. Uh, by the way, you, just three, you have just 30 days, I'm advised, <clears throat> until February 14th, Valentine's Day. I'm not sure about the significance of that, but you've, you've, there are 30 days to collect these, uh, these free CEUs. So please do that. Um, for those of you who are new to uh, PDF, um, this, of course, is only one part of the work we do. Our web page has tons of information on other things that we do that may be of help to you, families you know, people with Parkinson's, please visit our website at www.pdf.org, pdf.org, to learn more both about the expert reading series, of which this is a part, and any other educational programs and researchers who we support uh, that will also be listed there. So, without further ado, to go to our two gifted speakers today, we make it a practice, and I brag about this endlessly, um, to, once we've selected a subject, to get the very best people to speak to us. And um, uh, uh, today's uh, uh, seminar on um, dental and swallowing challenges is no exception to this. We have two uh, extremely respected uh, professionals from the University of Wisconsin, um, and each of them will speak to a particular aspect of this, and then together they will answer your questions. So it's really a team, even though we're separating the subject matter. Dr. Michelle Chiucci, um, she is a PhD. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders um, in the Department of Surgery, Division of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, longest title I've ever seen. <laughs> and she's a faculty member of the Neuroscience Training Program at the University of Wisconsin at the flagship uh, campus in Madison. Um, she has research interests that include the sensory, the sensory motor the control of disease, voice and swallowing, and the neurobiology of disease, with an emphasis on Parkinson's, which of course she'll be speaking to today. Um, so she's a teacher and she's a uh, she's a scholar, 
uh, one of her particular um, uh, interests is the complexity of the swallowing function in which she test, uh, studies with the uh, use of high-resolution manometry. I hope I got that right. I actually cheated by asking her before the session. But I believe that's what it's called. Um, and so she knows of swallowing ph physiology. This is going to be the main subject of her talk. She also runs an active lab, and she teaches two courses on the neural basis of communication and swallowing disorders and works in all sorts of other, uh, other places. She's a very, very uh, expert leader in this field. Uh, her companion for our um, so, uh, show today is, is Dr. Jane Bush. Um, she was trained as a dentist and was a, a dentist uh, through her career. Um, uh, and a fitness instructor also uh, in Cross Plains, Wisconsin, again with a focus on Parkinson's disease. She currently teaches fitness classes at the University of Wisconsin Health Sports Medicine Fitness Center, where she actually leads the Parkinson's education, I'm, I'm sorry, Parkinson's exercise program, and has all sorts of other um, uh, uh, commitments in that field. She talks about um, dental health, exercise, and dance in Parkinson's to groups. She's the author of an exercise manual DVD and is a member of uh, professional societies too numerous to uh, list today without taking all our time, but it's very impressive. I should also add that with her permission, um, I am um, not sure what the word is. I am very impressed to report that this uh, gifted person also lives with Parkinson's herself, um, and she gave us permission to say that and considers that adds to uh, the authenticity, even though it's hard to imagine she would need anything adding to what she's done. So we're very, very grateful to have Dr. Chiuchi and Dr. Bush leading our talk today. I understand that Dr. Chiuchi is to speak first and will take us through her slides and then seamlessly move into, uh, without further introduction, to Dr. Bush. And um, then we'll, of course, have the uh, questions following. If you don't know the routine here, you can... Um, as was said in the in the uh, introduction to our thing today, uh, use the text messaging feature built into the lower left-hand corner of your viewer page. During the time they're talking, you can do that, of course, freely. And we have uh, Eli Pollard, who runs our program, Valerie Holt, who's uh, working with her on this, um, will be uh, reading from their computers the messages that come in, and we'll be selecting them, combining them, and doing whatever things need to be done to them so that I will then be in a position to ask the questions once the introductory talks uh, finish. So without further ado, Dr. Chuchi, we introduce you. Thank you so much for being with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me today. I'd like to start out by noting that I geared this talk to two different groups of people. Um, first, individuals living with Parkinson's disease. I believe that uh, it's very empowering to have knowledge about conditions that might affect disease progression and treatment. And then also to the professionals that treat swallowing disorders or dysphagia called speech language pathologists or speech therapists. So my objectives for today are to review the complex pathology of Parkinson's disease and how this relates to swallowing deficits, to define the onset, progression, and nature of swallowing deficits associated with Parkinson's disease, to discuss surgical, pharmacological, and behavioral treatments for Parkinson's disease and their effects on swallowing function, and then also to provide some examples of common evaluation techniques and treatments used for dysphagia, which is disordered swallowing, associated with Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease is a complex disease. It's, it's most commonly noted for its primary disease pathology, which is death of dopaminergic neurons that have their cell bodies that live in the substantia nigra and project to the striatum in the basal ganglia. And this primary disease pathology leads to the classic signs of Parkinson's disease which are bradykinesia, or slow movement, postural instability, tremor, and rigidity. But we now understand that Parkinson's disease encompasses much more than these classical motor signs. There's disturbances in gait or walking, hypokinesia, cognitive deficits, depression, uh, dysfunction with the autonomic nervous system, sensory impairments, and then important to me particularly as a researcher and as a speech pathologist, dysarthria, which is impaired speech, and dysphagia, which is impaired swallowing. Now, this next slide that I show you is very busy, and it's up here to show you that the pathology of Parkinson's disease goes well beyond dopamine depletion in the basal ganglia. And this is some work done by Brock and colleagues 
about 10 years ago. And in the upper left-hand panel, what you see is um, a figure that describes the onset and the progression of Parkinson disease. And basically, it starts on the left-hand side with a stage one, which is the earliest stage, and goes all the way up to stage six, which would be the most severe stage. And without belaboring the details, what I want everybody to pay attention to is that there's degeneration that happens before dopamine depletion in the earlier stages of Parkinson's disease. And there's also degeneration that affects almost the entire brain. So it's important to know that Parkinson's disease is a very complex disease that eventually affects almost the entire brain. And why this is important is because swallowing is also a very complex act that also uses almost the entire brain. So it's not surprising that swallowing disorders can occur even in the earlier stages and then, of course, become very significant as the disease progresses. Also, as a reminder, other systems are affected by Parkinson's disease besides just motor control. So there may be issues with cognition, such as memory, executive function, and reasoning, issues with mood or affect, such as depression, sleep issues, and then problems with the autonomic nervous system, gastrointestinal issues, and issues with heart rate. And so again, just as a reminder that Parkinson's disease is a very complex and complicated disease, and all of these systems affected will affect health and quality of life and can also affect the swallowing impairment. Also, Parkinson's disease has many phenotypes or expressions of the disease, and so we really describe these as Parkinsonisms. There's genetic causes. There's the typical idiopathic Parkinson's disease that the majority of the population has, which is of unknown causes as of yet. It can be trauma-induced, drug-induced. There's people with young onset Parkinson's disease. And people have different expressions of their motor symptoms. Some people have a more tremor predominant form, and other people have a more akinetic or freezing predominant form. And what does this mean to us? It means that there's a variability in presentation. And so for those of you that work with individuals with Parkinson's disease or those of you that have Parkinson's disease, you know that no two people are exactly alike. And that's something that's very important to keep in mind when you are thinking about health issues and quality of life issues. So classically, the old way of thinking was that Parkinson's disease is a motor-only issue. The only neurotransmitter that was really important that was affected is dopamine, and the only brain regions affected are the basal ganglia. And people used to think that swallowing wasn't really affected until the later stages. But there's, I propose to you a new way of thinking, and that is that Parkinson's disease affects almost the entire brain, and there's even newer evidence that it affects the peripheral nervous system and muscles. Parkinson's disease affects other neurotransmitters. That it's really a problem of sensory motor control. Individuals have trouble scaling their movements, have trouble with magnitude of movements, and have trouble with sensory feedback that would help to make the appropriate movement. And also importantly, and one of the main take-home points of today is that dysphagia or disordered swallowing can occur at any stage of the disease process. I want you to think about the, the basal ganglia as a primary control, component of sensory motor control. And so when you're thinking about swallowing, swallowing is a goal-directed movement, and the movements are internally generated. It requires postural control and adjustment, and it's also a skilled movement. So many people think of swallowing as just automatic, but if you think about how hard it is to actually get something into the mouth and then chew it up and prepare it and move it with a tongue to swallow it down, it's, it's a pretty complicated, skilled movement. And you have to be able to adjust your movement to the environment. And in this case, for swallowing, your environment is the bolus or the item to be swallowed, food or liquid. So there's a lot of different presentations of food, thin liquids, um, puddings, mashed potatoes, or something a little bit harder to swallow, such as steak or crackers or nuts. And so your central nervous system has to be able to adjust how you swallow according to what you're actually swallowing. And as I mentioned before, the sensory motor control of deglutition or swallowing really encompasses almost the entire brain. The basal ganglia, or the primary units of motor control in the brain, do things like select and initiate motor plans. 
They help to sequence muscle contraction and force and timing of muscle contraction. They adapt to the changes in, in what you're eating or the bolus, and they help to adapt general motor plans. And so you can understand that when you have a disease that affects the basal ganglia, this can cause dysphagia because you see a decreased force of muscle contraction, you have decreased range of motion, slowness, a delay of onset of activities, and the ability, inability to really adapt to changes in the bolus. So if you're changing the volume, for example, by taking a larger or smaller sip of something or a larger or smaller bite, if you're changing the consistency of what you're eating, the inability to adapt to these changes can lead to swallowing problems. So now um, this is a little bit more geared toward the speech language pathologist, but some of the, the classical uh, signs and symptoms of dysphagia in Parkinson's disease, especially in the oral stage when food or liquid is being prepared to being swallowed, is a delayed oral transit, tongue pumping or fascinated tongue movements, uncontrolled bolus, premature loss of liquid back into the throat or the pharynx, uh, piecemeal deglutition, which is swallowing the bolus bit by bit, uh, residue on the tongue, and residue in the anterior or lateral sulci or on the sides of the cheeks. And in the pharyngeal stage, you'll see a lot of impaired motility, delayed excursion of the larynx, residue in the throat in places like the vallecula or piriform sinuses, for those of you who are familiar with where those areas are. There's penetration of the bolus into the larynx, which is the opening to the airway. Importantly, there's aspiration, and this is what this figure is showing. It's showing the darkened food or liquid um, from the barium contrast getting down into the trachea, which then gets down into the lungs. And then there's a tissue called the epiglottis that helps to protect the airway and that moves to cover it during swallowing. And there could be a deficient position of the epiglottis in a range of motion, um, thus hindering airway protection. Uh, for those of us who study swallowing as clinicians, um, really we think of swallowing as not just the oral stage and the pharyngeal stage, but as oral pharyngeal swallowing. And so if you'd like a, a gestalt of what the real problems are with Parkinson's disease, what you have is difficulty with bolus propulsion and clearance, and this results in residue or food or liquid remaining in the aerodigestive pathway and airway compromise. And that then causes inefficient swallowing or deglutition and the inability of the patient then to meet nutrition and hydration needs, which is a significant issue. Um, let's not neglect the esophageal stage of swallowing. Um, oftentimes you'll see weak esophageal peristalsis with food remaining in the esophagus. You can have esophageal spasm, a hiatal hernia, and there is also a higher incidence of gastroesophageal reflux. So that's just something to note as well. The morbidity and the mortality of Parkinson's disease and dysphagia uh, are very important. You will see weight loss, changes in diet, decreased quality of life, and very importantly, aspiration pneumonia. That is when food or liquid gets down into the lungs, causing a pneumonia, and this is the leading cause of death related to Parkinson's disease. Importantly, this is also a quality of life issue. Remember, eating and drinking is a social activity, and with Parkinson's disease, dining with friends, family, and work colleagues can be negatively impacted, and individuals are often reluctant to eat in public due to embarrassment about drooling, slowness of eating, or even fear of choking. People with Parkinson's disease may also have difficulty with reach-to-eat movements, which can also negatively impact feeding. So what do we do if we suspect somebody has dysphagia? Well, there needs to be an evaluation, and this is conducted by a qualified speech-language pathologist. And the first question we ask is, does this person have dysphagia? And I would argue that even in the early stages, the answer is probably yes to some degree. Swallowing impairments do not necessarily correlate well with general disease severity. And importantly, swallowing impairments are often under-noticed by the patient. And so, therefore, the speech-language pathologist needs to use specific targeted probes that may help the patient identify issues with more accuracy, um, such as drawing attention to things like a gurgly voice or coughing and choking or maybe reluctance to eat certain foods that the person has eaten in the past. And also, importantly, dysphagia might be under-noticed by the practitioner, including nurses, neurologists, physicians. 
Um, the person may not ask about dysphagia, and the questions on the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale do not really accurately get at um, the issues of dysphagia. Remember that there's also variability in individuals. There's variability with medication cycles, with fatigue, people may have deep brain stimulation, and of course, Parkinson's is a progressive disease, and so the swallowing disorder will not remain stable over time. The evaluation by a speech-language pathologist typically includes a thorough history, a medical history, a chart review, and a structured interview. It's very important for the speech-language pathologist to ask the patient and also to ask the significant other. As I mentioned before, sometimes individuals may not recognize that there's a problem, and if you ask the significant other who has eaten a lot with this individual, they may identify a problem that's there. Keep in mind that there are significant fluctuations in function, and I think it's very important to get a baseline imaging study immediately, even if there are no significant signs of dysphagia, because this will be your baseline for future studies, and you can compare changes from that, and there also may be preclinical signs, and you, as a speech pathologist, may be the first person to document this. Treatment for Parkinson's disease um, really has a couple of different arms. One of them is pharmacological that involves um, modulating dopamine or other neurotransmitters. There's surgical approaches, uh, ablation and transplantation, or more commonly, deep brain stimulation. And then, of course, there's behavioral interventions and exercise. There are some issues with the common treatments for Parkinson's disease on swallowing. Um, and so it's very important for the um, therapist to review the medications that people might be taking, levodopa, comps, or MAO inhibitors, dopamine agonists, or other medications, because these medications do have side effects, and these side effects may oftentimes affect swallowing. And it's also important to evaluate the, the patient on and off of these therapies as they could interfere with swallowing. Unfortunately, there's no evidence that these medications that might improve tremor or other kinds of motor function improve swallowing function, and they may, unfortunately, actually diminish swallowing function. In terms of deep brain stimulation, this has been studied to a lesser degree, um, and we found that there's no improvement in the oral stage of swallowing. We did find some mild improvement of pharyngeal transit time and reduce pharyngeal residue and aspiration when the stimulator was on, um, but overall not a lot of general improvement to swallowing. We think that likely movements that require more precise or fine motor control may not be improved by DBS, but the overall transfer of the bolus to the pharynx and airway protection might be improved, especially with DBS of the subthalamic nucleus, which is a common site. Um, so the impact of deep brain stimulation on speech and swallowing likely depends on where the stimulated, um, the stimulation of the electrodes are actually implanted and stimulation parameters. And this is something that really needs to be considered more in research. But as of right now, we don't think that there's a lot of improvement to swallowing or speech for that matter. So what we can do right now, um, all roads really be to exercise. There are a couple of prescribed exercise treatments. One of them um, is called LSVT or LOUD, which is a speech treatment, and they studied crossover effect to swallow and found improved tongue-based movement in the oral and pharyngeal stages, and then also improved um, what they called oral pharyngeal swallowing efficiency. So there are some, some mild to modest improvements in swallowing with a speech treatment. Uh, in terms of respiration and swallowing, Individuals with Parkinson's disease often have a weakness in voluntary cough, and that is often related to penetration and aspiration. And when individuals undergo expiratory muscle strength training, there was a decrease in penetration and aspiration. There are some other treatment uh, options that will, would be prescribed by a speech-language pathologist. One of them um, is compensatory strategies, and so oftentimes patients will be instructed to tuck their chin or have their chin down when they swallow, and that led to less aspiration. There's another technique called a supraglottic swallow that involves uh, holding the breath and bearing down during swallow, but this was ineffective in individuals with Parkinson's disease. And there's also really no evidence for um, using an effortful swallow or another technique that speech pathologists are familiar with called the Mendelssohn maneuver. 
But I do argue that some of these um, effortful swallows and other techniques that really exercise the larynx maybe could be used as a swallow-specific therapy, even though they might not improve swallow physiology while swallowing a bolus. There's modifications that you can make to the bolus. So you can ask somebody to take bigger or smaller sips or bites. And I would say that sometimes maybe bigger might be better because there is a role of sensation in swallowing. Um, people tend to default toward maybe taking smaller bites and sips to be safe, but I think that the speech pathologist should try both and see what the effects are on physiology. Um, oftentimes, thickening liquids um, leads to less aspiration, although people tend to not like the texture of thickened liquids and thickened liquids are associated with increased pulmonary complications, so that's something that should be considered carefully. Um, there is a role for exercise, and I believe that we should begin to address dysphagia very early on in the disease process. As I mentioned, LSVT loud or expiratory muscle strength training may be beneficial, or a speech pathologist can design their own treatment paradigm based on individual needs that might include diet modifications, postural changes, it's important for frequent follow-up and to observe the person over time, and also to evaluate people with PD and both their on and off states, especially if they have deep brain stimulation or medications that may significantly affect the swallow. I think it's important to follow the principles of exercise, and that is um, consider intensity. Intensive practice is important for maximal neural plasticity, as is frequency, Repetitions, you need to consider the amount of force or resistance that you want this person to use in exercise. It's important for the person to use a lot of effort and you want to be accurate. Complexity is important. Complex movements and environmental enrichment promote greater structural plasticity. And of course, you want the task to be salient. salient. Rewarding tasks activate basal ganglia circuitry. Now, fortunately for most of us, eating and drinking is a salient activity that we enjoy. Uh, use it or lose it is important. Inactivity may accelerate deficits, and continuous activity may slow disease progression. And timing is also important. Injury, such as cell degeneration, creates a fertile field for plasticity. So intervening, intervening early is important. So specifically, um, with patients, you want to identify their particular areas of difficulty for that individual and address that area with exercise using a simple cue, focusing on effort, um, and involving how does that feel, using intensive practice, salient practice, and then to determine the amounts of cueing to maintain or carry over. So um, I'm almost wrapping up here, but I wanted to give you a concrete example, and that is begin intervention early and continue intervention throughout the disease process. Practice should be task specific. So for you speech pathologists out there, focus on an exercise to improve laryngeal elevation, but do this during a swallow and not during a different task. Use a single cue to minimize a cognitive load. So use a phrase such as swallow hard instead of a multiple complex instruction such as put this pudding in your mouth, hold it, push your tongue back forcefully, really lift your larynx, squeeze your throat. So the phrase that you, should, should, um, that you use should elicit the behavior very illicitly very easily. Make the task highly salient and rewarding. As I mentioned, luckily for most people, food is both salient and rewarding. And choose items that people like to eat and drink if they're safe. Have high intensity and in multiple repetitions, multiple times a day. And then, of course, include a sensory reca recalibration component. So identify the appropriate behavior, such as the amount of tongue froze to clear a bolus, Instruct the patient to feel that amount of effort that it took to elicit that behavior and focus on the, that amount of effort. And although it may seem exaggerated, the, the patient must be trained to use that amount of effort so it becomes habitual. So now I'd like to thank you for your time and turn the slides over to my colleague, Dr. Bush. And I thank you for having me speak today. Um, hopefully, um, having been a dentist for many years and now a person with Parkinson's, I can portray both sides of the coin for you. Um, I do know as a practicing dentist that patients often view a dental appointment with unease. Um, we ask them to come into the office, lay back on their back, open their mouth wide, and we invade their personal space and, space, and we put strange objects in their mouth. 
But you add to that um, jaw rigid rigidity and a tremor, and you have um, some extra dental challenges that face the PD patient. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to start with some general effects of Parkinson's disease and move on to facial effects and oral effects. Um, we'll talk about actual dental treatment for the person with Parkinson's, as well as oral hygiene tips for the, for the person that you can do at home with their home care, and wrap up with a summary. We hope by doing this seminar um, you'll be able to understand some of the oral and facial effects of Parkinson's disease, as well as learn ways to make your dental treatment easier and more successful. You'll also discover some tips for maybe effective oral hygiene care for, for routine, your routine at home. Uh, general effects of Parkinson's disease. Um, generally, people with Parkinson's are affected by fatigue, um, both mental and physical fatigue, which may occur during the dental treatment. So we want to be cognizant of the time and the length of the appointments. Um, patients may be anxious, uh, uneasy, uneasy during dental procedures because of some of the things I explained already and, and other things we'll discuss. Um, there's depression and apathy, as well as even forgetfulness, which makes keeping appointments and hygiene compliance um, a little more difficult. And then there's the issue of orthostatic hypotension, which can affect standing after being in a supine position for a long, length of time. You also have sometimes the need for uh, frequent bathroom breaks, which can be embarrassing for the person to request. Uh, as well as postural changes that might make sitting in the chair for a length of time a little uncomfortable. Um, as far as the facial effects of Parkinson's disease, um, as Michelle mentioned, there's bradykinesia of the facial muscles. They cause a slowness of chewing and a difficulty in biting down correctly. Uh, speech is impaired, uh, voice may be softened, words slurred, speech hurried. Hesitation is often a common symptom. Um, this may affect the ability to communicate effectively with the dental office and their staff. And as far as conveying maybe uh, issues of pain and things like that, communication is so critical. And with that and the mask-like appearance that sometimes support, support Parkinson's portation, portray, they, um, they sometimes lose the effect of communication. There's reduced sense of smell and taste. Um, L-DOPA and even vitamin D supplements can uh, affect the taste, and as you know, smell is a very common symptom. Decreased blink rate and upward gaze of eyes is a symptom, as well as that mask-like uh, facial appearance. Um, it's sometimes hard to read um, all of our expressions. Uh, we tend to have many faces of Parkinson's disease. We may be joyful, pensive, irritated, fearful, bemused, bored, ticked, stunned, and just downright ecstatic. Interesting, they all look similar. Now on to facial effects, rigidity, tremor, and dyskinesia. This can lead to TMJ discomfort. The TMJ stands for the temporomandibular joint, which is located in front of your ears on either side of your jaw, and it is the, the joint that moves the lower jaw um, up and down and right and left. And you can get discomfort, discomfort due to muscle rigidity in that area and tremor. This may lead to inability to chew properly, which can lead to cracked teeth and attrition, which is tooth wear. And if you wear dentures, it might affect the stability and the wear of the denture. Tremors and dyskinesias of the forehead, eyelids, lips, tongue, and mandible often make the dental visit equally difficult. Rigidity and tremors of the hands may cause loss of dexterity, which lead to oral hygiene issues. Drug dyskinesias may also cause something called bruxism, which is tooth grinding. Now on to the oral effects of Parkinson's disease. Let's talk about saliva. Salivary dysfunctions is very common in Parkinson's disease, um, but what does saliva really do for us? Um, it's very important. It actually lubricates the oral tissues. It assists in chewing and swallowing. It provides immunity to infection, and it buffers, preventing tooth demineralization. Um, the acids in the mouth that are elicited from the bacteria that are located in our mouth after we eat sugar um, create demineralization or a loss of, of uh, enamel to the uh, dental, dental structure, and uh, we need the saliva to buffer that. So uh, on one hand, you may have a problem with excess saliva or sialuria. This can affect up to 78% of PD patients. Um, this is related to drooling, and drooling or saliva that, that comes out the corners of the mouth can lead to something that we call angular chelitis which is actually a fungal infection that occurs in the corners of the mouth. Um, and it does require treatment, usually with an antifungal agent. Sialuria may also be treated, though, with anticholinergic drugs such as imanidine. Just as commonly, though, we see a problem with xerostomia. That's lack of saliva or dry mouth. You, because of that, you see an increased risk of tooth decay, especially root caries that happen along the gum line. 
Um, the causes for xerostemia, it's the disease process, but it's also related to general aging. Everybody's mouth gets drier as we age. Um, drug therapy side effects, especially the anticholinergic drugs, will affect this as well. Uh, treatment, we often treat it with artificial saliva substitutes. Those are over-the-counter. You can talk to your pharmacist or a dentist um, or your neurologist about these. There's a number of them on the market today. Um, or you can try sugar-free hard candy, especially the citrus ones like the lemon that will elicit, elicit more of a salivary response. Um, you can avoid irritating products such as alcohol, tobacco, spicy, and acidic foods. Burning mouth syndrome is actually a subcategory of xerostomia. It is when the tissues of the mouth become very dry and painful. They actually appear more reddened. It affects up to one-fourth of people with PD. Um, it is caused by the, the lack of saliva, but it also can be uh, associated with infections, nutritional deficiencies, poor oral hygiene, and even the medications themselves. Dental disease. Uh, let's look at dental caries, which we call dental decay. The research is showing mixed results, but there is an increase of decay, and it will occur if oral hygiene is poor. Untreated decay can lead to tooth abscesses. And realize the mouth is not a, a part of the body uh, all, all, on, all on its own. It is actually part of the rest of the body. And untreated abscesses can get into the, the cir circulatory system and the lymph system and actually become a systemic infection over time. So now let's talk about dental treatment for the person with Parkinson's. The most important part of the dental treatment is a very thorough medical history review. The more the dentist knows about you, the better she or, she, she or he can provide proper treatment. The dentist should update your overall health. Look at your Parkinson's level of disability and medications, both prescription and non-prescription. They will often record your vitals, blood pressure, pulse, and respirations. And they may consider a medical consult. Um, it's important to know the disease stage, the, ability, the cognitive ability or impairment, um, drug interactions, and treatment modifications. Um, even in advanced uh, levels of Parkinson's, sometimes it may even require a hospital setting to have uh, a lot of dental work done, completed at one time. Um, dentists may evaluate for nutritional deficiencies. People with PD are more likely to be vitamin D deficient. The archives of neurology study showed that more than one half were D insufficient and one fourth were deficient. So it's important to uh, maintain nutritional levels of all the vitamins. Um, gingival health is very dependent on good nutritional status. Dental treatment for the person with Parkinson's involving PD medications. I want to talk a little bit about MAOB inhibitors. Resagiline and saligiline, excuse me. Um, brand names are Azelect and Endopril. Now, there is a concern with epinephrine. Epinephrine is an ingredient that's found in most local anesthetics that they use to numb the tooth. And these, epinephrine can raise the blood pressure. So it's definitely important that you let your, your uh, dentist know that you're on these medications, and they might want to get a neurology consult as to, as to the level of epinephrine that is comfortable for you. Uh, this seems to be more of a concern right now for saligiline um, because that seems to be metabolized a little bit differently. Um, if you're going to actually have elective surgery, uh, oral surgery, and it requires a general anesthetic, you may even want to stop the uh, MAOB inhibitor ahead of time. Also, if you're on these inhibitors, you should be avoiding or limiting the, uh, such things as Demerol, over-the-counter cold and cough medicines, those that contain pseudoephedrine, phenylephrine, and dextromethorphan, and, of course, antidepressants, the MAOAs, the SSRIs, which stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors, the SNRIs, which is Selective Norepinephrine Reuptake Inhibitors, and the tricyclics. Dental treatment may be hampered by a number of things. As I spoke before, it can be hampered by rigidity and a decreased mouth opening, the bradykinesia or slowness of the facial muscles. Difficulty in biting down correctly makes it hard for us to, to get that occlusal bite correct and comfortable. Tremors and dyskinesias of the tongue and the head, saliva difficulties, swallowing difficulties, and even generally fatigue and anxiety, ortho -hy orthostatic hypotension, and speech difficulties. Those are all extra challenges that the PD patient faces. Um, so what do we recommend? We recommend more frequent checkups, teeth cleaning every six months, three months if there is a sign of gum disease. Even if you wear dentures, routine visits should be screening for oral cancer and evaluating that fit of the denture. Ask the, the um, dentist 
keep the dental chair more upright to assist in swallowing. Plan for shorter morning appointments, about 45 minutes in length. And schedule the start of the appointment about 60 to 90 minutes after your levodopa dose. Restoration of the oral health is best completed in the early stages of Parkinson's. You want to replace old fillings, crowns and bridges, ill-fitting dentures. Consider dental implants, especially for over-dentures. Uh, dental implants today are, are becoming quite popular, and they're very stable. They'll keep that denture uh, secure and in place. Um, it's so nice. If you have a large treatment plan, try to get that done early in the stages because you want to be able to maintain things as time goes on. Um, after treatment, be sure to rise from the dental chair slowly to prevent orthostatic hypotension. I know that the, the, the thing, you know, you feel like you just want to get up and jump out of there as fast as you can, but please take your time. Alert the staff that you need to be slow in getting up, that you may be dizzy. Have them keep an eye on you. All instructions given to you should be both oral and written, and also given to your caregiver if needed. Good oral hygiene should be encouraged to reduce complex treatment at an advanced stage, as well as redu reduce the risk for systemic infective endocarditis from oral bacteria. As I mentioned before, any infection in the teeth or in the jaw can be transmitted through the bloodstream to the rest of the body, and of, of significant concern is sometimes it lodging in the heart or the heart valves, causing a, a bacterial endocarditis. So uh, it's, in, it's important to stay healthy and keep healthy, including your mouth. Now, oral hygiene. What can you do at home to facilitate or good, uh, good oral hygiene and good dental appointments? Start with toothbrushing. Be sure to use the toothbrush with a large handled grip and soft bristles. A small brush head reaches the corners better. Um, the regular grip brush can be fixed with uh, inside like a bike handlebar grip or a tennis ball for more stability and dexterity. And electric toothbrushes are great. I mean, they have some timers on them and they have larger handles, so um, consider an electric toothbrush if you're having trouble with tremors. Uh, we recommend you brush after every meal for two minutes, and remember to brush your tongue. The bacteria will adhere to your tongue as well. Uh, try a one-handed strategy. Use the stronger side of your body. Um, personal experience, I'm a right-handed um, person, and I have learned to, to uh, brush my teeth with my left hand because I have less tremor on that hand, and uh, it can be done. It just takes practice. If you can't brush after a meal, rinse your mouth with water and replace your brush every three months or if the brush bristles start to show wear. So don't be brushing with that frayed toothbrush every day. Flossing. Flossing is important, and I know it's difficult for even the average person to, to do, um, but we recommend you floss once daily, preferably at bedtime. There are floss aids out there. There's little floss swords, that you, as you can see in this picture. They also make a, a floss holder that is reusable, as well as a little interproximal brushes that you can uh, kind of get between the gum line. Um, so all little aids to help keep uh, the interproximal or the between the teeth area clean and, and cavity free. Caregiver assistance may be needed as the disease, disease progresses. Oral hygiene is definitely related to nutrition. Uh, poor oral hygiene will affect increasing risk of weight loss, stroke, and heart problems. So you want to eat nutritious meals and snacks. You want to avoid snacking on high sugar sweets, especially soft and sticky candy. And you want to avoid sipping on soda or fruit juice all day, especially, or instead, drink water. The, the decay equation is that we all have these, these uh, bacteria in our mouth, gut forms of bacteria in our mouth, and they eat the sugar we eat. And as their byproduct, they give off an acid. And it is that acid that will demineralize the enamel and cause what we call decay and also affect gum disease. Um, so every time you take a sip of soda that has sugar in it, you're producing um, approximately 20 minutes of acid. So the more often you sip, so if you sip on soda all afternoon, the more often you sip, you get 20 minutes each time of that. You know, it's far better to drink it all at once and then rinse with water to, to get rid of that sugar, sugar stuff. The other thing is, as Michelle mentioned, um, consistency of food is so important. And I know as time goes on, it becomes harder and harder to swallow. We tend to avoid um, like raw vegetables, which are so nutritious and good for us, and tend to, to choose the softer, stickier, more sugar-laden foods. So it's important to, uh, to uh, have, a, have good oral hygiene. It's important to have good dental, a dental dentition and, of course, to address swallowing issues so that you can eat a well-balanced diet. Um, oral hygiene, we also have something called rinses. We have a fluoride rinse, which is um, over-the-counter, uh, can be swished and spit. Again, if you have trouble with um, swallowing or aspiration, 
if you still are able to swish and spit, do that with your mouth over the sink and, and then look down as you do it so that gravity will allow the uh, solution to come out that way. Um, more easily effective is to get a prescription fluoride gel, which can be applied with a toothbrush or a sponge applicator, or, or antimicrobial rinses can also be applied with a brush or sponge applicator, and they will help reduce the microbes in the mouth, and uh, they basically are used to treat uh, gingival gum disease. Clean your dentures daily. If manual dexterity is difficult, try attaching a nail brush to the surface uh, with a suction cup and move the denture across it. You know, you're free to use soaking cleansers, um, or even a little white vinegar and water works as a cleaning agent, too. Um, so as, actually, these slides are just a review, a uh, review about informing your dentist of your medical history, scheduling shorter appointments, morning appointments. I uh, request uh, keeping a maintenance schedule of uh, recall appointments and requesting the staff be cognizant of some of the needs you have, like, uh, like getting up slowly. Oral hygiene, again, this is a review. I put these at the end of the slides so that you may refer to them uh, as needed and not have to go through the whole seminar again. Use a large-handled toothbrush. Uh, use your strongest hand. Uh, definitely floss with an aid, and remember to take care of those dentures. Uh, if decay is a concern, add a fluoride rinse. Um, if gingival problems or gum disease is a concern, add a uh, antimicrobial rinse. Uh, employ good nutrition and limit that high sugar, sugary foods. So I thank you for listening, and we'll open it up, I think, to questions and discussions. That's great. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Terrific. And uh, we do have time for questions now, probably 20 minutes, going a little over time. We do have quite a number that have come in. Uh, before I um, get to those, I'm going to just uh, repeat the instructions. So those of you who um, are still thinking about questions, uh, the, use the text messaging feature that's built into that lower left-hand corner of the viewer page. Click in the box, enter your question, and then click on the send button. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, which is more likely than not, um, we will um, uh, get back to you. We know who you are, so we'll get back to you later with the help of um, <coughs> our two speakers. Um, and other resources so that um, everybody who asks a question, I hope, will get an answer before um, a couple of days pass. Um, I also want to um, – uh, I'll, I'll save the other stuff. I'll just go to the questions now. Let me start with one that um, <clears throat> intrigued me from Connecticut, uh, and it was a, a woman who was asking us <clears throat> whether um, the, the act of singing, the muscular and other – uh, activities and, uh, and and exercise that goes into that particular discipline. Does that help, uh, uh, Dr. Chucci, uh, therapeutically with the challenges of swallowing? That's a great question. So singing, singing is a great thing to do for several reasons. You have to really draw on your breath support. You challenge your larynx or your or vo voice box to do things that it might not do in normal conversation, and you also activate other parts of the brain that you might not with typical speech. Um, and it's also so you, you might have some compensation for some of your deficits because of that, and it's enjoyable. It gives us joy, and we should always do things that give us joy on a daily basis. I don't think anybody's ever swallow, um, studied whether or not singing or a singing program improve swallowing, or um, I apologize if they have and I, and I haven't come across it, um, I, would, I would imagine that um, for most things that you do um, in terms of exercise for Parkinson's disease, they tend to need to be task-specific, so that if you want to um, improve your swallowing, you need to do things that are more swallowing-related. Um, however, if singing might address some of the things that are impairing your swallowing, for example, coordinating your respiration or not having a strong cough or good breast support or um, not having good laryngeal function, then I could imagine that some of the benefits from singing might peripherally bleed over to some degree and could potentially help with swallowing, but there's not really a lot of evidence if that, if that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, turn to your partner, uh, Dr. Bush. Um, a uh, caller from Virginia uh, would like to, uh, reflecting, I'm sure, what for many people is a reality of the lack of, uh, of, of manual dexterity that sometimes comes with Parkinson's, and both speakers were very careful to allude to that in different ways. This person is asking if flossing is difficult for him, 
would a water pick be the next best, best option? Or perhaps more generically, Dr. Bush, since you talked about plussing at the end, is there any other advice you may have for people who have the uh, problem with that particular motion um, and uh, what would be a good substitute for it? Um, yeah, flossing does require some manual dexterity, um, unless you have a caregiver provided for you. Um, and a, a water pick or a, or a ir water irrigation device is a possible um, change in, in what you could try. The concerns I have about the oral irrigation is that, that if you have any swallowing issues, um, you might have trouble with aspirating the solution. Um, secondly, uh, it, you have to be very careful where you direct the irrigation. You don't want to, you don't want to direct it against the tissue in a, a way that is going to harm the tissue. Um, so you'd want to use it at a very low setting and just kind of uh, gurgle it through those sulci or those pockets of, of, of between the teeth. Um, but I, uh, my biggest concern with the oral irrigation would be the swallowing issue because, again, it, it, that's a, a big concern. Um, if you do not have a swallowing issue, then I think it would be a, a, a something you could consider. Thank you. I'm going to keep you on stage for the next question, too. Um, there's one from Indiana um, uh, in which our caller asks, uh, that, that seems to have a, a, a difficulty of imagining sometimes that the jaw is moving around uh, when maybe it's not. And I really inject a personal thing into this conversation, but my own stepfather had Parkinson's, and I remember that he had a problem of uh, imagining things in the dental and jaw area sometimes uh, that really were not happening, but he uh, felt that they were happening. And uh, in this case from Indiana, uh, our caller is asking uh, Dr. Bush, does that moving, the feeling of moving, is that normal? Uh, is that something that can be um, uh, imaginary, there's, uh, there's something you can do about that to uh, to uh, ease what sometimes can be the anxiety that comes from that particular uh, problem. So, are you asking if if there is no movement, but it's a feeling in in on the in the brain? I, I believe yes. I'm not in a position to ask him on the phone now, uh, but I believe what he's saying is that it feels like the jaw is moving around, whereas in fact it's not, uh, but it feels as if it is. Yeah, as long as the jaw is not moving, it, it will not make it any more difficult for the dentist to provide treatment, but it w may cause some anxiety for the patient. Um, sometimes what we do um, to keep the jaw stable is we put in something called a bite block, which allows you to rest onto a piece of, of square of rubber that doesn't make you to hold open, because in holding open, you're activating uh, the muscles in contraction, and you may be feeling some kind of an internal tremor from that. Um, so allowing you to rest onto a bite block will take away the neuromuscular signals that are occurring or being sent to the brain. Um, that would be one thing that the dentist could consider as far as during treatment. If I may interject here, I think um, maybe what this person is describing is um, akesthesia, which is an internal sense of restlessness, and people can feel it in, in different places of their body. Um, so that is a common that is a common um, issue with Parkinson disease, and so sometimes, um, as Dr. Bush mentioned, some sensory feedback to the area that's affected can sort of help with that restlessness. And, and, if, and if in our evaluation we feel the patient is in, is experiencing anxiety, we can consider treatment with a sedative or even nitrous oxide sedation. Good. Thank you very much. Um, here's a question I find particularly interesting. It's from a caregiver. Obviously, we have many people who are caregivers on the phone with us today. Uh, she's from Virginia and uh, is, is raising the question. She says she finds that distracting her partner can actually make it easier to remember how to swallow than over-focusing on it. Um, the very interesting question, how... Uh, Dr. Churchy, would you um, would you respond to that? Is it sometimes better to actually think about something else and then something maybe more normal about the way in which one operates this very complicated thing we call swallowing? Sure. Yeah, that's that's a great strategy, and it really depends on the on the nature of the swallowing problem and the nature of the motor problem. So sometimes. Um, the same thing with speech or any other kind of motor task. Um, let's say if you're frozen and you're trying to step, sometimes um, distracting the person from their their internal thoughts on that can help compensate for their lack of being able to do it. And so if that's something that works with an individual, I think that's a great strategy to try. Um, other people would say that they have to focus more attention because when they get distracted, their swallowing problems become worse. 
So as I so as I mentioned, you know, at, there's a lot of variability with this disease and within individuals. And so when you find something that works, that's a that's a great thing to do, and it's a great thing for people to try if they're stuck on a problem. Which is why I think these webinars are great because you can share tricks and strategies and knowledge that way. That's great, and I think the generic here that I'm looking at from a PDF point of view is uh, gathering some of these things. Um, if there are those tips that our experts are talking about today that uh, that you may know better than we do and you may even know better than our experts do, uh, do share them with us. Email to uh, the same place you've been emailing your questions to uh, the PDF um, in New York, and um, we will. Um, you can be sure that we will look at these and build them into our own education uh, programs, so that we take advantage. It's sort of a crowdsourcing for human experience here, which which enriches our own education. Speaking of which, by the way, and this is a slight digression, we do have a slide. I think at the end of the series on resources uh, that Parkinson Disease Foundation. It's actually up right now uh, on the screen. I can't see it, but you can. And um, so do study that in odd seconds. Uh, and after the session, of course, you, at, your, at, your, uh, at your convenience and your leisure. And then let us know if there's anything you want. A lot of we have up here in our own library of various sorts that we can, of course, share with you afterwards. Um, here's a question. I think this is Dr. Chuchi first, but you can um, answer, each of you can answer um, uh, separately. Um, here's a person from Florida who um, is asking um, whether the following related or unrelated things, I'm not sure which they are, are typical of Parkinson's. One is numbness of the mouth or tongue, and the second is inability to distinguish hot from cold in foods and liquids. They may be related, I don't know, but uh, are either or both of these, ladies, symptoms of Parkinson's sometimes? So um, the, the sensory fibers that carry information such as temperature and pain um, or then the feeling of numbness are, are basically the same kinds of fibers. So those, the numbness and the abil inability to distinguish hot from cold are, are related. Um, and there are sensory issues with Parkinson's disease, um, including pain and sometimes numbness. And I'll let Dr. Bush ex expand on this a little bit better, but sometimes just you know just because you have Parkinson's disease does not mean that you're you're exempt from getting other kinds of issues. And so when you have something um, that's concerning, I think it's always good to get it checked out by a professional in that area. And I'll I'll turn it over to I, Dr. Bush. I agree wholeheartedly with Dr. Tucci. Um, there is always a a list of differential diagnoses that we can encounter. And so if somebody comes in with numbness. We will, it will be, we will look at the medical history as far as Parkinson's and saying, yes, that's a possibility that it's being affected by that. But we'll also want to rule out other reasons uh, such as nerve pathology, uh, tooth morphology, um, possibly necrotic uh, infections, things like that. So we will we'll want to do a thorough dental exam and make sure there's not any un un other underlying causes because, as, as uh, Michelle mentioned, um, a, we aren't immune to getting anything else. Just because we have Parkinson's doesn't mean we can't get the common cold. That's such a good point, and it sounds so obvious when you both say it, but it's just something we don't always think of, and I think that was very good to remind us of that. Thank you very much. Here's a very specific question. This person's from Maryland, and um, she is um, talking about her husband who has Parkinson's. She's a caregiver, and she's noticed that when, uh, when he's drinking uh, liquid, um, from a glass as opposed to through a straw, um, there's a tendency to cough when drinking from a glass that apparently is avoided when he drinks through a straw. Um, the, uh, there's, I think there's two sort of questions nestling in this one. One is, uh, is this, a, for Dr. Chuchi particularly perhaps, is this something that, um, I, I don't think you raised this in your points. If you did, please forgive me. We try not to ask the same questions twice. Is there, in fact, um, a tip here that it's better to use a straw than a glass in this situation? And then the related question, which the person from Maryland is asking, is could this be an early sign of dysphagia? Yes, yeah, so these are both excellent questions. So coughing is a sign that food or liquid is either getting into the entry to the airway or down into the airway. So coughing is, is definitely a sign of dysphagia and of airway compromise. Um, and so um, the way that we would eliminate coughing or choking really depends on how that person's 
specific physiology is impaired. And it sounds like for this person, for whatever reason, drinking through a straw might, um, there's probably a couple things that are going on. When, when people drink from a glass, they tend to tip their head back. And when you tip your head back, um, just like in CPR, you open the airway. And so sometimes it, when drinking from a cup, you're tipping your head back and that liquid is rushing back there and then you're, you're opening up your airway, making it a little bit more vulnerable. However, when you drink through a straw, you're also creating this negative pressure that's sucking liquid up. And so sometimes for people, drinking through a straw is a little bit more dangerous than drinking through a cup. It just really depends on the individual. Um, but what I would recommend um, is that this person does get evaluated with an imaging study, um, either a modified barium swallow study or a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. There are two different kinds of imaging studies done by a speech pathologist. And then they can actually see um, if liquid is getting down into the airway, and they can tell if there's a difference between a cup or a straw, and then they might be able to make some recommendations about how to modify um, drinking to make it the most safe for that individual. Great. Make it all sound so simple. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple other questions. Um, uh, one is related to this last one. Um, the, another person from Michigan is, is um, asking whether, uh, given the problem with this dysphagia, which perhaps she or uh, the, the care partner, the, um, the person with Parkinson's is suffering, uh, is there an argument for um, actually going on to an all liquid diet, um, or maybe the opposite. I'm not quite sure which direction to go with this one. But is an all-liquid diet or the avoiding of an all-liquid diet something that can, can, uh, people should consider, um, presuming it's um, nutritiously well-balanced, which obviously is a given in the question, I believe. Uh, is that something that people should consider because of the problems that dysphagia can cause? Sure. So modifying liquids and solids, again, as I'm repeating over and over, really depends on the individual's swallowing impairment. So for some people, liquids are more difficult and dangerous because they get into the airway and they need to be thickened or avoided completely. For other individuals, solids need to be um, modified into a puree or a ground solution. And so the only way to tell what's the safest is, again, to get an evaluation by a speech-language pathologist and then get a recommendation regarding um, the consistency of liquid, should they be thin or varying levels of thickness or avoid it altogether, or um, how should we modify solids, should they be ground up. Um, and that can only really be answered after the person undergoes a thorough evaluation and an imaging study. Um, but there are lots of different options um, if you have to modify diets. And, you know, one thing I didn't mention is that people do eventually need to get alternative nutrition and hydration, which may be via a feeding tube. And just because you get a feeding tube doesn't mean that you can't eat anything safely by mouth anymore, but sometimes people have difficulty meeting their nutrition and hydration needs orally, and they'll turn to a feeding tube to supplement. And so that's a very, um, it's a very personal decision that's made um, with a lot of uh, good medical information. Thank you very much. I'm told by uh, the, our back office here, the brilliant women in our back office, that the, the questions are coming in fast and furious. So I'm so sorry we're going to be able to answer all of them now, but we'll do our very best to do it later. Just a couple more now because of our, our pressures of time. Uh, first of all, of Dr. Bush, um, this is a very specific question, also from Michigan. Michigan is very busy today. I'm not sure it's the same person or not. I suspect it's several people. Uh, does the mouth collect plaque faster when you have Parkinson's than when you don't? Uh, it can because of the fact of xerostomia. If you have xerostomia or dry mouth, you don't have the saliva to lubricate or buffer the teeth. So plaque can accumulate at a more rapid rate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Definitely reason for uh, three to six months cleanings. That's a very good uh, piece of advice. Uh, one more question of Dr. Chuchi, then I'm going to ask a final question um, of you both. Uh, Dr. Chuchi, a person from I don't know where this person's from, um, but I'm sure it's a common question and, and concern. Um, if you begin choking when you are in the act of swallowing, what should be done? Are there d direct uh, techniques that you'd use with or without Parkinson's, or is there some particular piece of advice you'd have which, for what could be obviously a very, um, a very scary situation? 
Sure, and this is probably something that reminds me to, to, to put in my PowerPoint. So choking is, um, you have an increased risk of choking with Parkinson's disease. And so it's very important that all caregivers and people in the household or facility know basic life-saving techniques and know the Heimlich maneuver. So if somebody is choking, and that means that they, they're not coughing or making any noises. They have an obstructed airway, and somebody needs to immediately give them the Heimlich maneuver. Sounds like a very, very important piece of advice. I'd never heard that given before, but um, my goodness, um, given the stakes involved, that is certainly a terrific thing uh, to finish with, and I really appreciate that very much. One question of both of you. There was a person from Georgia who asked a, a question um, in connection with a particular symptom, but I'm making it generic. Her, her question had to do with age and whether there are techniques in both the um, uh, swallowing uh, area and also the dental um, health and management area. Uh, are there some things that could be more difficult as one gets older, uh, whether or not one's had Parkinson's for longer, which is a separate point? Uh, this person, particular person was dealing with a spouse who's 78 years old. If somebody with that age or in their 80s, are there aspects of what we've been talking about for the last hours for the last hour that are uh, particularly difficult to maneuver? Are there things that, um, is it your feeling that uh, in individually that um, age is not the issue, but it's just a matter of, of uh, taking it as it is and, and dealing with the stage of Parkinson's as it is and giving the same advice that maybe cannot be done quite the same dexterity as it would be younger? Any, op any, any uh, comments you have on the relationship of age and the other pieces of advice that you've been giving us so expertly today? Sure. So we used to think that Parkinson's disease was a disease of aging, and now we know that the onset can happen at a younger age. Um, but the, the things that we're talking about today, um, including swallowing issues and dental hygiene issues, um, these things become more difficult as we age, and there's age-related changes to, to swallowing, and there's entire branches of, in, in my field, dedicated to looking at age-related changes to communication and swallowing. And I believe Dr. Bush would agree with me that there's age-related changes to um, your oral hygiene in your mouth and, and just in terms of your physiology in general. So when you add Parkinson's disease on top of aging, some of these issues become a little bit more difficult. So um, dysphagia can happen with normal aging. Dysphagia can happen with Parkinson's disease. And then if you compound um, a very elderly person with Parkinson's disease, all of these issues become a bit more significant, if that makes sense. Thank you. Any comment on that? And, yeah, I, I agree. Um, everything, is that, everything with aging is accelerated, I think, or in, in large, made larger with Parkinson's, so things that are maybe normally di difficult. Um, the thing about aging, though, is, is part of it is, is mental as well as physical, and you are as old and as young as you believe you are, and your courage to fight things uh, needs to, to remain. You need to remain. You need to continue to have spirit, um, and or, and not let aging be the reason for for things being more difficult. Um, it, it's that cup half full attitude that I believe in um, personally. That. We all are aging uh, from the day we're born, and it's not an excuse and it's not a reason to play the victim, as is not Parkinson's. Um, we all have our struggles in life, too, and the, the, the way you deal with these struggles is part of, of the way you cope with life in general. And uh, so I think, you know, things that are difficult with Parkinson's are made more difficult by by allowing them to be, and so uh, I think it's it's the courage. And, and I have found being in the PD community now myself that the people with Parkinson's are probably the most courageous people I see and the people with the most optimism, and I, I really commend these people for, for dealing with life and what it brings them as, as time goes on. I can't think of a more wonderful note on which to end this uh, presentation that was just um, – uh, powerfully inspirational, and thank you very, very much for that as for your expertise. This is just wonderful. I have a few very brief public service announcements to make before we close. Um, uh, there is, I think, on your screen now, I don't have it in front of me because we're not set up that way in our office here, an online survey. Um, this is our standard survey 
we do uh, very, very carefully watch this, analyze it, use it for future uh, sessions. So please uh, don't think you'll be wasting the couple of minutes it will take you to uh, respond to this and let us know. We'll have it tabulated in a couple of days, and we use it in our own work here to plan the next session. So please do that. Um, uh, number two, I'd like to thank again um, our sponsors who made this series possible, um, Abvi Incorporated and Teva Neuroscience. We're very grateful to both these companies for making uh, something available that otherwise we could not afford to do from our own uh, usual resources. So we thank those two uh, terrific companies for making this possible. Um, for those of you who like to see things twice, like a good movie, um, um, or have friends you want to refer to this, um, I should advise you there's going to be an archive of the event which will be made available beginning next Tuesday, which is January 21st. Uh, come to the website. You probably know how to do this now, www.pdf.org. We'll then send you an email with the link when it's available so you can listen to the talk again and let your friends know about that. Um, please be aware, those of you who are, um, are, uh, are groupies on this series, and I know there are several of you on this call, maybe several, a couple of hundred, who come to virtually all of them, which we're thrilled at, um, please be aware that our next uh, expert briefing will be on Tuesday, March 11. That's Tuesday, March 11, 2014. It'll be 1 o'clock um, Eastern Time, the usual time. We'll be led in this uh, session by Soterios Parashos, uh, MD, a doctor um, at the Struthers Parkinson Center and the Minneapolis Clinic of Neurology. That, of course, is a peerless, um, independent, uh, groundbreaking uh, Parkinson's Center uh, that the, they developed in Minnesota 15, 20 years ago now, um, and uh, still one of the very best places in America, and we're delighted to have this uh, very general topic um, that is a, a appeal to everybody, led by um, some, an expert from the Struthers Center. So I think that is all in the way of announcements, so I want to thank again our two terrific speakers. Um, it's so interesting to me and to our colleagues here how uh, the subject that is um, uh, so terribly important does not seem to get the attention that it, uh, I think it deserves in so many other uh, forums of this kind. And um, I thank our, our uh, colleagues on the phone, those who we crowdsource to get these opinions, as I thank the experts who have led us so brilliantly in this today. We're very grateful to both of you. Um, do keep your thoughts and opinions coming from outside. Thanks again to uh, Dr. Chuchi and uh, Dr. Bush. And have a great balance of winter from those of you who are in winter climes and those who aren't. Have a great whatever it is, seeing the season where you are in South Florida and places like that. Enjoy the week, enjoy the month, and we'll talk to you again and hear from you again, I hope, on March the 11th. Thanks again. So long.